During our study of quadratics last unit, we looked at solving equations by factoring. And we're going to be doing the same thing to some extent as we work through higher order polynomial equations. So in this lesson, we will be looking exactly at that, solving polynomial equations by different methods. The first we're going to look at is solving using factors. And based on what we learned last lesson, if we were to take an expression or a factor such as x minus a, what we would have to do is find the x value that made this equal zero and that would become a solution to the equation. And if that x value is a real number, then that will be a place where our graph would at least touch, if not cross over, the x-axis. So let's get some practice solving some of these equations through factoring. So our first one x to the fourth plus 3x squared minus 4 equals 0. This is what is called a quadratic-like equation because our exponents follow a pattern of a value, half that value, and then no variable at all. So we can treat it as if it is a quadratic, just we're going to be pulling out this type of an expression for our x. So do we know two numbers that multiply to negative 4 and add to 3? And the answer is yes. This can factor down into x squared plus 4 and x squared minus 1 equals 0. Well, our right hand side here can factor further. This becomes x plus 1 x minus 1 equals 0, and still x squared plus 4. So now, what does it take to make each part of this 0 using our zero product principle? Well, for our second one, we have x equals a negative 1. Our third one, we have x equals a positive 1. For the other, we're going to have to pull it aside. x squared plus 4 equals 0. Solving this, we'd get x squared equals negative 4. Taking the square root of each side, we'd have x equals plus or minus 2i. So this has four solutions. Plus uh, a positive 2i, a negative 2i, a positive 1, and a negative 1. So we were able to find all the possible solutions, and that included imaginaries. Let's take a look at the next one. x to the fifth plus 4x cubed equals 5x to the fourth minus 2x cubed. It's easiest to solve these when they're equal to zero, so let's move everything to the side with the highest exponent. And this is, you can see, a quintic equation. So, what we would end up with is x to the fifth minus 5x to the fourth plus 6x to the third equals 0. What I did was I subtracted 5x to the fourth and added 2x cubed to both sides of the equation. Now let's go into factoring. All these have an x cubed that I can factor out of them, leaving me behind with an x squared minus 5x plus 6 equals 0. Factoring what's inside of the parentheses, we come out with x cubed. What multiplies to a negative 6 and adds to a negative, oh, sorry, multiplies to a positive 6 and adds to a negative 5? That would be x minus 2 and x minus 3 equals 0. And what we have here for solutions is x equals 0, x equals 2, and x equals 3. And as a note, going off of what we learned last lesson, this has a multiplicity of 3 because it was an x cubed. So what this actually was was x times x times x times x minus 2 times x minus 3 equals 0. So each of these had the same solution. So, going through, we can factor our 
polynomial equations if they end up resulting back into some sort of quadratic-like expression. So we need to be able to factor ones that are a little bit higher. Let's take a look at a couple of special patterns that exist in the cubics. In our quadratics, we had two special patterns when it came to factoring. We had the difference of squares, and then we had perfect square trinomials. Well, now we're going to be looking at special patterns for our sum and difference of cubes. When we were dealing with quadratics, we could only do a difference of squares. Now we can do sum or difference. So if we start out with an expression that is a cubed plus b cubed, the way this will factor out is we'll have an a plus b term, and then we will have an a squared minus ab plus b squared term. And if you were to go through and distribute and multiply this out, you would get back where you'd started. Just to be able to show that, a times a squared is a cubed. a times a negative ab is minus a squared b. a times a positive b squared is a b squared. Now distributing the b, we would have a plus a squared b minus an a b squared plus a b cubed and you can see we have a negative a squared b and a positive a squared b a positive a b squared and a negative a b squared so we're left with just a cubed plus b cubed now what happens if it's a difference of cubes well all we're doing is we're manipulating where the plus and minus are at. So this will come out to be an a minus b times a squared plus ab plus b squared. And you could check that the same way. But what would happen if we were told that we had an equation such as x cubed plus 8 equals 0? and we needed to solve this. Well, x cubed is a cubic term, 8 is a cubic term. So what we would have is x plus 2, the cube root of each one, times x squared minus 2x plus 4 equal to 0. Now we would be able to solve the first term as being just a factor. We'd have a negative 2. The second one, we'd have to use something like quadratic formula. But now we're able to expand a little bit further the types of equations we're able to solve through factoring. Now how would we solve some of these by graphing? We're going to solve the equation x cubed plus x squared equals x minus 1 using two different graphing methods. The first graphing method will be to graph them exactly as they are as two separate equations and see where they intersect. So let's get a graphing grid and then set to work on graphing this. The easiest one to graph will be the right hand side x minus 1. We have a y-intercept of negative 1 and a slope of positive 1 so we end up with just a line going across here and connecting those points gives us this line. Now the second one is a little bit more tricky. We can factor out an x squared and we'd be left with an x plus 1 as our other part. So using our factors and our zeros, we'll have a 0 at negative 1 and a multiplicity of 2 0 at 0. It's cubic with a positive lead coefficient so we're going to be ending on the right hand side high and starting on the left side low. Let's get a couple other values in here. If I were to substitute in a positive 1, we'd have 1 times 2, which is 2. If I substitute in 2, we would have 4 plus 3, which is 7. What happens if I substitute in a negative 2? We'd have 4 
times a negative 1, which is negative 4. And if we were to go to a negative 3, it will be off of our chart. So, a quick graph based on this information gives us something that looks like that. And we have a crossing somewhere around a negative 1.8. So we're going to say a negative 1.8, some other value. And you'd need to go through and evaluate. Graphing calculators are very helpful for this, and we'll take a look at that in just a second. But a second method for solving this is to set it equal to 0. So, again, another graphing grid. And then let's solve it so we're equal to 0. That would involve subtracting x and adding 1 to each side of our equal sign. Then we have x cubed plus x squared minus x plus 1 equals 0. And what we are looking for is where would this equal 0? So we know again it's cubic. We have a low left hand side and a high right hand side because our lead coefficient is 1. But let's start substituting in some values. Creating a quick table of x and y. If we go negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. Negative 2 cubed is negative 8. Negative 2 squared is 4, bringing us up to a negative 4. Minus 2 is a negative 6. Plus 1 is negative 5. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1. one negative 1 squared is 1, so that's 0. Plus 1, plus 1 gives us 2. Substitute in a 0, we'll come out with 1. Substitute in 1, we'll have 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1, so we come out with 2. And substituting in a 2, we would have 8 plus 4, which is 12, minus 2 is 10, plus 1, giving us 11. Plotting these points would give us negative 2, negative 5, negative 1, positive 2, 0, 1, 1, 2, and 2, 11 is going to be off our graph, but graphing this, we end up with something like this with a crossing somewhere around a negative 1.8. Now again, pulling this up as work done on a graphing calculator, we will end up with graphs that look like this, and then, using the trace feature, we come out with exact solutions at the point in negative 1.839 for both this intersect, uh, zero point or root and this intersection. Now the x, the y values are going to be different for each one. The y value on the second one is zero. The y value on the first one is a negative 2.839, but our solution is whatever that x value is. So we have a number of ways of solving these algebraically and graphically. What, how can we use something like this, finding these zeros, in more of a real life situation? Let's take a quick look. So one day, three school students are practicing their math and found that when they multiplied their ages, the product was 480 more than when they added their ages. How old are the students? Well, this is going to take a little bit of work, but is very feasible and capable for us to be able to do. So let's take it apart. We have three students. Oh, something that I didn't put in here is that their ages are consecutive. So they'd be like, two, three, and four years old, but they wouldn't be out practicing their math. It could be 12, 13, and 14. But if we take their ages and add them together, knowing that the ages are consecutive gives us a bit of an advantage. We could say their ages are n, n plus 1, and n plus 2. This would help us find the youngest. But a little method I've learned over the years that simplifies this is if we have an odd number of people or odd number of items that are consecutive if we name the middle one 
then the one before it and the one after it become a little bit easier and then when we add all three of these together that plus one and minus one get rid of themselves so if we take their ages and add them together so n minus one plus n plus n plus one that is or as opposed to taking their ages and multiplying them together that when we multiply their ages it is 480 more than when their ages are added so we take their the sum of their ages and add an extra 480 and we end up with the product so let's start simplifying on the left hand side we can drop our parentheses this minus one and plus one neutralize each other so all we're left with over here is 3n plus 480 and that is going to be equal to multiplying this out doing a little bit of rearranging we come out with n times n squared minus one multiplying that we have 3n plus 480 equals n cubed minus n. Moving everything to the right hand side, we have 0 is equal to n cubed minus 4n minus 480. And then we can use our graphing techniques and abilities. So pulling out our graphing calculator and throwing this in there real fast, will give us a graph that looks like this. Now we're not interested in the imaginary answers, only the real ones, and upon examination this only crosses the x-axis one time. That is here where our x or n value is equal to 8. So 8 was the age of the middle child. So the ages of the children are 7, 8, and 9. So being able to solve polynomial equations, we can do it graphically, we can do it by factoring, we can do it with some combinations in between. But the methods that we learned dealing with quadratics are acting as a good springboard to get us started here in our higher order polynomials. So become more and more familiar with your graphing calculator, be able to use it and the factoring that we learned in previous lessons plus our new sum and difference of cubes here because we're going to be needing them moving forward.